there is a word in the dictionary so controversial and so evocative that the mere mention conjures up a myriad of images and emotions. That word is witchcraft. Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. Two. And under cold stone days and nights as thirty-one. Poison venom, sleeping god. Boil thou first in a charmed pot. Double, double, toil and trouble. Fire burn and cook and bubble. In his Scottish play, Shakespeare shows his witches making potions, predicting the future, admitting the killing of swine, the sinking of ships, and the raising of winds. All of these were reason enough for others to persecute them and burn them at the stake. They were seen as the instruments of chaos and the workers of evil and the only way to rid the world of this evil was to burn it out. The witches of Macbeth are really something of a pastiche. They're, they're stereotypes, if you like, um, exaggerated images. As to real witchcraft, well, again, we're dealing with an area which has got a lot of myths and a lot of exaggeration attached to it. Um, we're used in the 20th century to the image of the old hag, which I guess is based somewhat on uh, on uh, Shakespeare's view of, of witches, um, the evil old woman stirring up her bruise in a pot and so on. But witches in the, uh, the traditional sense were never really like that. Paganism, or Wicca, or witchcraft, or whatever, whatever you want to say, has been so misrepresented by the church and the state for so long that people still don't really understand what we, what we believe in, what we stand for. There are so many connotations um, and so many misconceptions. Witchcraft is a very ancient uh, set of beliefs, the beliefs that some people had powers by magic or some other supernatural means to control and influence things. Um, that's different from paganism. Paganism is a belief in other gods, the non-Christian god. And although people often lump the two together, in fact, they are completely separate. Even the use of three witches in the play reflects folklore. It is a mystical number, the beginning, middle and end, the phases of the moon, birth, life and death, and mother, father and child. Even witches themselves have their threefold law. It is believed that any magical act sent out by a witch will return to them with three times the strength. For instance, an act of goodwill returns goodness to the witch three times over. Consequently, if the magic is used with ill intent, it will also return, but with a very serious outcome. And yet, if we think of witches, we think of them as acting against the common good. We recall the tales of persecution, torture and death. Many instruments of torture were created specifically to extract confessions from a silent or reluctant witch. And a whole series of tests and trials were developed to identify the witch. In England, the first statute against witchcraft was decreed by Henry VIII in 1542. The second statute against witchcraft was passed in 1563 during the reign of Elizabeth I. It decreed the death penalty for all convicted of murder through sorcery. The third statute was made by James I. He was terrified of witches. He believed that witches in Berwick had created a storm to sink his ship whilst he and his wife, Queen Anne, were on board. During his reign, he authorised the publication of the first copies of the Bible in English. At first, this contained the words, Thou shalt not suffer a poisoner to live. These were altered to read, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, seemingly by royal decree. He also wrote his own book on witchcraft, entitled Demonology, to outline the case against witchcraft. 
The Christian faith is often seen as promoting a series of do's and don'ts for the way people live their lives, whereas Wicca seems to suggest that if it harms no one, then do as you please. But that begs the question, how do you assess whether what they're doing harms no one or not? Is it simply that it harms none of the people involved in that particular activity? But even then, how do you assess that without having objective rules to refer to? On the continent, fear of witchcraft had reached epidemic proportions. Mainland Europe held the most severe record for witch trials and torture. The accuses ranged from lord to peasant, as did the accused. The inquisitor, usually appointed by the local town or church officials, would torture the accused for confessions, using whatever physical force they deemed necessary. Hundreds were burnt at the stake. In small towns and villages, disputes between neighbours were fraught with danger. The possibility of being accused as a witch was terrifying. Paranoia naturally grew to immense proportions. The majority of those accused were women, and it is recorded that in some towns in Germany, the female members of the population were almost completely wiped out. Typical of the torches in use was the Bamberg Witch's Chair. It was made of iron, with the seat covered with studs. The accused was made to sit in the chair while it was heated over a fire. The ensuing confession was usually followed by the stake. In England, witches were hanged, not burned. Burning was seen as the punishment for heretics, and this is not what witches were accused of, of being. They were charged with killing or maiming people, or animals or people, by witchcraft, and they were therefore prosecuted and punished for that criminal offence, for the injury they had caused. In the continent, by contrast, witches generally were burned, and that's probably where the misconception has arisen about the fate of English witches. As with many cases in history, time distorts, and it has produced many other popular misconceptions, notably the use of the ducking stool. Witches were not, in fact, uh, ducked, as the popular misconception goes. Ducking, um, tying somebody to the end of a seesaw apparatus and ducking them in the village uh, pond was a punishment for so-called scolds, a scold being uh, a bad-tempered, quarrelsome, uh, irritating woman, abusive woman, and the, the punishment was seen as a way of, of cooling her temper, and in practice, of course, it's a, a form of public humiliation, very effective as such. The nearest equivalent in the case of witchcraft is what was called swimming a witch, in which a group of villagers would tie the suspects with ropes and tie her to a rope, and then drop her into a, a pond or a river to see whether she floated or sank. If she floated, this was seen as a token that she was being rejected by the element of water, the element of baptism, and that was a, seen as a token of probable guilt. If she sank, that meant she was probably innocent, but of course she then had to be pulled out and rescued pretty quickly in case she drowned. But in either case, that would not be the basis for a formal punishment. The villagers would then have to report her uh, alleged offence to a magistrate, and it would then proceed to trial before a judge and a jury in a proper court of law. Perhaps the most notable of witch finders was Matthew Hopkins, who, in the time of the English Civil War, became the self-styled witch finder general. Matthew Hopkins is uh, fairly obscure by origin. He's probably the son of a Suffolk clergyman, but he comes into prominence in 1645 when he discovers a mission, as he sees it, to root out and destroy witches uh, in East Anglia. And this is the launch of a, a crusade over the next two years in which he uh, has over 100 people executed in Suffolk, Essex, and the Eastern Counties of England. Now, the interesting thing about Matthew Hopkins is that Although people imagine he ranged widely up and down the country, burning witches wherever he went, in fact, that's not true. His area of operations was very small, and it was restricted to East Anglia. Um, he had a great deal of trouble 
finding witches wherever he went and resorted to all sorts of intimidatory tactics in order to get people to confess or to, um, uh, uh, to report on their neighbours. He's seen today, I think, as a, as a tragic figure in some ways, as well as a, as, as a disaster in terms of the consequences of what he did. He seems to be genuinely motivated by a sense of mission, of crusade. He thought he was one of the good guys doing God's work to root out these monsters. That's not, of course, how he's seen today. Before the witch went to trial, there was the matter of trying to extract a confession as conclusive proof. Hopkins favoured sleep deprivation. He would keep a suspected witch in solitary confinement. Later, his assistants would strip her and deprive her of sleep by walking her day and night. After a few days of this, the confession usually was easy to extract, as were the names of her conspirators. Then came the trial. Yes, that the trials were in fact remarkably fair by, by the conventions and stanzas of the 16th and 17th century, by which I mean that they were held before uh, a judge on a circuit, an assize court judge and a jury, and the evidence was weighed up and sifted very carefully. The witnesses were brought forward, they were questioned and examined, and it was by no means a, a case of automatic conviction. Uh, in, the, in the sense of a, a, a panic producing an automatic conviction. The majority of suspect witches were in fact acquitted and only about one in five of those accused was eventually hanged. So the courts did try to sift between what they thought as well documented cases and what they thought of as perhaps just the result of rumour or prejudice or malice by, by neighbours. Even though the evidence of course is very circumstantial in all cases. Hopkins, like the practices of persecution, has also been the subject of historical controversy or misconception. Nobody knows for sure what was driving Matthew Hopkins. It used to be thought that he was driven by greed. I think that's unlikely. He did get paid fees and a certain amount of expenses, but they were not large sums, and at the outset he had no way that he was of knowing that he was going to be paid at all. It may be that he came to like the notoriety that he achieved, but the evidence suggests that he was genuinely a man with a mission, a misguided mission, and he thought of himself as on a crusade, doing something that was essential to rid the world from what he saw as, as this sinister evil in the midst. And that the period is a significant one. It comes at the end of the Civil War, when structures had broken down to some extent, and that gave him the opportunity to do far more damage than he would have been able to do in normal times, in peacetime. There is actually a genuine mystery surrounding Matthew Hopkins. Um, when people finally had enough and chased him out, uh, he disappeared and nobody knows where he went. Um, it has been suggested that he went over to America and um, it has been suggested that he's resumed his activities there, although there are alternative suggestions that he, he went to ground and enjoyed his, um, his wealth, which he accrued through his witch-finding activities. However, at least one author I know has, um, has pointed to the fact that the Salem witch trials, although some 50 years following the, uh, the uh, witch craze in East Anglia due to Matthew Hopkins, could just possibly have fallen within Matthew Hopkins' lifetime. I leave it at that. I have no view on whether that's true or not, but an interesting little mystery. In Salem, Massachusetts, in 1692, three children of the village had, according to some records, been introduced to magic and the occult by a family servant, Tituba. They became prone to fits and unexplained screaming. Samuel Paris, the local minister, considered that the behavior was due to diabolical possession. First, the girls accused the servant, Tituba, who confessed freely to the accusation of bewitching the girls. Little is said of Tichiba's use of magic, but it is commonly believed that she introduced the girls to the art of voodoo. The three girls then proceeded to name others, people who could not understand why they had been implicated. Between the 10th of June and the 22nd of September, 19 residents of Salem had been hanged. In the case of Salem and the American, in that case, um, the 
episode begins with some quite young girls, adolescent or pre-adolescent girls, claiming to have been possessed. Now, what a psychiatrist or a psychologist would make of that, we can only speculate. They, they quickly discovered that this gave them an amazing and, and novel degree of power within their own family and, of course, within the, the, the local community. Normally, a teenage girl's opinions counter for less than nothing in that context. All of a sudden, they are now the centre of attention in the whole community, and they quickly discover they have the power, in effect, of life and death over, over their elders by making claims. She possessed me. You know, she is a witch. And I think there's little doubt in that case, and in many cases in France, that uh, you get a sort of snowball uh, f effect that takes place as they, as they grow to understand and then to relish their power. And there are some examples of that in England itself, of, of children or adolescents claiming possession and then being uh, corrupted, if you like, by the, by the power they realise they have now possessed. Finally, a tide of public revulsion arose against the trials. Based on flimsy evidence gained under intimidation and extreme pressure, the Salem trials were not continued beyond the initial indictments. A different examination of the events also presents a plausible explanation for the trials. Paris received much of his support from the poorer farmers of Salem village. To them, Paris and the village church represented stability and traditional values. They saw Salem, with its increasingly important merchants, as a threat to their way of life. Many of those who were the victims of the witch hunt, led by Paris and his supporters, had links with this new Salem. The story of Salem was immortalised in play form in The Crucible by Arthur Miller. He wrote the script to mirror the McCarthy trials that were being held in America at that time. The parallel of accusations becoming a frenzy where no one was safe was clear to be seen. However, in most people's minds, literature, as comment, has become confused with historical fact. I think in England and in America, witchcraft does not really come from people with power. So I don't think that would be the right way of, of seeing it. it. Essentially, in England, and indeed in America, it begins at a grassroots level with friction and rivalries and, and clashes of personality within a small local community. Um, very often the, the witch is somebody on the margins, often elderly and popular, uh, at, at loggerheads with her neighbours. Perhaps the best example of persecution of a so-called witch for political aims is to be found in the story of Joan of Arc. She had become a threat to the church and the state, but rumours of witchery and the voices she admitted to hearing in her head were used as a legitimate reason to execute her. Joan of Arc was burnt at the stake by the church in 1431 for heresy. There can be little doubt that this was solely for political reasons, because 500 years later, Joan was canonised by the very church who put her to death. There is a theory, um, not given very much credibility by historians, but nevertheless current, that Joan was a witch. And this is a persistent um, legend. It recurs in several different forms. The most straightforward one is that she was an adherent of the old religion, um, strict witchcraft, and that she was fulfilling certain kinds of duties in relation to um, that old religion. I mean, one needs to remember here that Don Ramey, where she was born, had a reputation for witchcraft. It was known, for instance, to have a fairy tree and a fairy well. And it's under the fairy tree that Joan first heard her voices. So there is a strong suggestion that e if she, even if she wasn't a witch, she was certainly influenced by the old religion. But personally, I incline to the view, um, which is slightly more prosaic, um, that Charles VII was actually a rather weak, um, self-seeking, vain uh, man who was rather glad to be rid of her. I mean, let's, uh, let's not forget, Joan had this reputation for being very argumentative, very willful. And she, um, when she was captured by the Burgundians, 
um, she was captured on an action that she herself had initiated against the, the express wishes of Charles VII. So in a sense, getting rid of her was quite a relief for a man who, after all, did not want to engage in, in warfare. Other persecutions were made for purely material purposes. In the 14th century, a campaign was led by King Philippe le Bel of France against the Knights Templar. He laid accusation that this order of warrior monks were guilty of all sorts of witchcraft. This included the worship of an idol in the form of a severed head and the wearing of a heretical cord, a sure sign that the wearer is a witch. The truth seems more prosaic. The Knights Templar had grown up as an order to guard the roads and routes to the Holy Land during the time of the Crusades against the Saracens. The church initially approved of their actions and granted them exemption from taxes and the power to raise their own. The order built its own ports and had its own fleets. Because they were seen as a safe pair of hands, they became the bankers for the kingdoms of Europe and moved vast sums of money from place to place for a fee. The wealth of the order grew. It was probably the desire for this wealth that motivated the French king's actions. Unfortunately, most of it slipped through his hands in the Templar fleet that fled from France to safety in Portugal, England and Scotland. How did such a fear of witches arise to the point where it could be exploited by those in power? To investigate that, we have to turn to the roots of modern-day paganism. Paganism is a religion which honours nature, and whether its followers worship in groups or individually, they usually prefer to worship in the open air, in a natural place. They honour various festivals throughout the year to celebrate the sun's effect on the earth. Often the moon's effects are celebrated in monthly gatherings. Paganism, um, or Wicca, is a love of the earth, a love of nature, um, and everything that's on there, everything that's on the planet, the, the stones, the wood, the trees, the flowers, the animals, the birds. Um, and of course, the, we believe in the dual personification of the god and goddess. The modern day faiths have their beginnings lost in the mist of time. It is thought that as the last ice age advanced south, European man believed in two images that explained their way of existence. The goddess of the earth, she who created all life in all forms, and the horned man, he that experienced life and death as both hunter and hunted. As the early hunter-gatherers became farmers in their hill forts and settled in their towns and villages, their ritual beliefs are thought to have become more organised. Structures like Stonehenge and Avebury, sitting in their complex landscapes of barrows, hill forts and avenues, may point to an ordering, an organising, of the religious life of the communities. As the communities became more complex, so did the organisation. The Greek and Roman ancient societies formalised their concepts of gods into pantheons, in this, they reflected the Norse and other societies that had gone before them. And yet, the common theme of the Earth Mother and the Horned Man runs through them all. It was with the coming of the early Christian church that the seeds for the later persecution were sown. Roman Emperor Constantine I at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD had the problem of bringing together all the different strands of the organized religions that existed at that time. He had been converted to Christianity and wanted to settle the arguments about the divinity of Jesus. Out of this council came the Bible and the early Christian church as we know it. At first, 
there was a great deal of harmony between the Christians and the followers of other ways. It made sense to place the major Christian festivals, like Easter and Christmas, at the spring equinox and winter solstice, which were already established as a time of celebration and ritual. Images from the early faiths have even been incorporated into Christianity. During Advent, Christ is compared to the sun as the light of the world, and the image of a green man can be found in many churches. I think you'll find that the roots of Christian beliefs can't be found in paganism. They're found in Judaism. But what we do find in paganism are the roots of the way we go about expressing our beliefs in the sense that the Christian festivals have evolved out of their uh, pagan roots where the festivals were taken over. For example, Christmas around the winter solstice, candle mass around Imbolc and the like. But as Christianity reached out into rural Europe, the common folk saw little difference between the story of Christ and Mary and their own version of the earth mother and child. They had little fear of Christianity's effect on politics and the state. Therefore, they were able to believe in both religions. The old ways continued as they had before, with the wise ones at the center of authority in the villages and hamlets. These were the ones that people would turn to for magic, healing, and prophecy. The ones who bore the knowledge of the ancients. Eventually, they would collectively be known by the Anglo-Saxon term Wicca, roughly translated as the shaper or bender of the unknown. This would become the definition for witch. But this harmony of the two religions living side by side was to be short-lived. This is where the persecution began. The church condemned the Earth Mother by declaring that as a goddess of Earth, she was the creator of earthly delights and pleasures, which the Bible had declared a sin. They went on to proclaim the horned man was the personification of the devil, an angel that had been cast out of heaven for his sins and who created and resided in hell. The medieval devil bears the face of a goat, which could be derivative of the Greek god Pan, or it may have come from the goat Amalthea, who was the wet nurse of the Greek Zeus, or the Roman Jupiter. Thus, the battle lines were drawn, with the consequences that we have already seen. The, the Christian church is in dialogue with uh, people of all faiths. But what we have to appreciate is that such dialogue is costly in many respects. And therefore, if the church were to enter into a dialogue with paganism, then there would be, have to be an enormous amount of groundwork, and it would have to be a priority in order for the church to put that necessary effort into the dialogue. What we would find, obviously, is that there would be no common ground in terms of doctrine and belief. But there would be some interesting dialogue in terms of our view of the world, in terms of ethics, and in terms of ritual. Even though the church in the 10th century tried to dismiss the existence of witchcraft, and a church law was passed declaring that belief in magic and witchcraft was heretical, witches continued to pursue their craft. The 12th and 13th centuries saw the revival of goddess worship. Poets would write odes to the goddess, disguised as poems written to loved ones, while cathedrals and churches were built to Mary, the mother of God, who had replaced the earth goddess as the divine mother. It was during the 13th century that the church reversed its policy in the denial of witchcraft. But it was not until 1320 that Pope John XXII formalized the persecution of witches by authorizing the Inquisition to prosecute sorcery. Four years later, on the 3rd of November, 
Petronella de Meath was the first to be burnt at the stake in Ireland on charges of witchcraft. From that time on, the papal bulls and declarations became pitilessly severe on the condemnation of witchcraft. In 1484, Pope Innocent VIII issued the bull summis desiderantes, allowing Kramer and Sprenger, two members of the Inquisition, to systematize the persecution of witches. Together they wrote the Malleus Maleficarum, known as the Hammer of the Witches. The, the Malleus Maleficarum was uh, a huge and learned and bizarre tome written by two German uh, Dominicans in the late 15th century, explaining in enormous detail what witches did, the organization of a whole elaborate uh, cult of devil worship. And it, it's, it was both the product and the spur to a much greater degree of systematic uh, persecution and harassment of alleged witches on the continent from the late 15th century onwards. And it appears two or three years after a bull by the Pope at the time uh, denouncing witchcraft. So these are both key pieces of evidence showing how the authorities are becoming more concerned with the phenomenon of witchcraft as a major threat. Well, we find that the uh, height of persecution for witchcraft appeared in the Middle Ages, and that was a result of an alliance between two groups of people. On the one hand, you see the church pursuing witches with a vengeance, and a lot of their pursuing was a result of wanting to establish themselves as a power within uh, the country, not so much uh, wanting to hold the purity of doctrine in place. But they couldn't have done their job without the local people's help. And often you can remember stories from films you may have seen of people hounding out the eccentrics from within the community and presenting them to the church authorities as witches. Very few of these people actually were witches. They were just eccentric people. So when you look at these two groups of people working together, you wonder, well, what lies behind it all? And therefore, there's another force, and that is the force of insecurity. When a society is insecure, like most of Europe was in the Middle Ages, then an insecure society rounds on anyone who represents a minority. And in this case, it was the witches. Now the witches were neither followers of the old religion, heathers, nor teachers. They were the slaves of Satan. It was considered by the church that witches were women, as they would easily succumb to the devil's lust and evil. To increase the people's belief and fear, the church simply reversed Christian rites and practices. Witches worshiped the devil instead of God. They would parody the Christian mass and delight in earthly pleasures. It was when the church described witchcraft as heretical that the last doubts of the common people were dismissed. It is only in recent times that we have seen a re-emergence of the old ways. Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, witch's mummy, more and gulf of the ravined salt sea shark. Bruce of Hemlock, dig to the dark. <laughs> and slips of you, slivered in the moon's eclipse. In modern day witchcraft, the closest equivalent to magical potions and spells is the use of herbs. Herbs are put into oils, salves, simples, and decoctions. They are used mainly for healing or protection, and are said to be drawing upon meditation and the Earth's energies. People who are accused of being witches, white witches as well as black witches, did use herbal concoctions and so on, but I don't think using herbal potions in itself would ever count as magic or would have been seen at the time as counting as magic. There would have to be some incantation or spell, something of a supernatural flavour added on to the brew. And if you think of the witches in Shakespeare's Macbeth, they have all their uh, objects thrown into the cauldron, but they're also muttering spells and formulae. And that, that's the, the magical dimension to this. 
A healing ritual is performed by many paganists annually to denote their devotion to the earth. They assemble at different locations all over the world to celebrate or heal the earth with love. The ritual they perform is designed to return some of the power the earth has given them to its source. They focus on the life-giving resources the earth provides. When you think of the typical image of a witch, you think of them maybe casting a spell or doing something magical. Uh, but uh, in reality, I understand that the majority of their work is not about magic, but it's about ritual, which is different. Now, as far as magic is concerned, obviously, as a Christian priest, I don't believe that their magic has power uh, in itself. The power that it does uh, exercise is the power of suggestion and the power that it has over others in a psychological way. But we mustn't underestimate that kind of power because it can be as real as anything else. Witches and stories about them have passed into folklore and then on into literature. Perhaps one of the earliest examples is Medea from the Greek mythologies. Struck by Cupid's arrow, she fell passionately in love with Jason. She helped him to complete three seemingly impossible tasks in order that he might gain the Golden Fleece. From England comes the story of Merlin the Wizard, the wise old counsellor who reluctantly used his magical powers to help Arthur become the King of Legend. The variations on this theme can be found in many modern day examples. The modern-day revival of the old religions can be traced back to 1888. A collective of senior masons founded the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, a society dedicated to discovering the wisdom of the ancients, and a young man called Alistair Crowley was initiated into the order. As a child, he was only allowed to read the Bible, but in the early 1890s, whilst Crowley studied at Trinity College in Cambridge, his horizons were greatly expanded by his encounters with the classics. After his teachings within the Golden Dawn, he travelled the globe extensively, and it was during these that he received a series of mystical revelations in Cairo. There is little doubt that Crowley greatly influenced the revival of ceremonial magic and old beliefs. It is possibly due to his work that we have horoscopes and Ouija boards. Gerald Gardner, who is considered by many to be the founder of modern Wicca, was initiated by Crowley into the orders that he led. It was Gardner's passionate interest in the revival of the craft and his many books, which may have contributed to the modern growth of these beliefs. I don't think there's any real connection between the witchcraft of the Middle Ages, 16th and 17th centuries, and modern Wicca. I think it's an example of what's called the invention of tradition, that modern Wicca uh, devotees would like there to be such a tradition and such a connection, and they are trying to recreate what they think happened or they would like to have happened, but I think in a, a, almost universally it, it's a new phenomenon. hand fasting ritual practiced today. As with all religions, paganists celebrate the union of a couple with a marriage ceremony. The act of a hand fast is similar in some respects to many wedding ceremonies. There are, however, some differences. The term hand fast is not symbolic, but literal. The man and woman are tied together at the wrist by a cord and remain bound together for 24 hours. This declares their love for each other 
and the sincerity of their vows. To conclude the ritual, the handfast couple must jump over a broomstick held by the high priest and priestess. Once united, they must remain together for a year and a day. Well, over the 20th century, people have tried to find some system of belief that will give them all the answers, or at least solve all their problems. They've tried science, they've tried uh, politics, and found that they both have their limitations. And now at the end of the 20th century, people are looking for something else that will give an answer to the questions the heart is asking. And so they're looking again to the whole realm of spirituality. And now they look at it with a greater freedom. They look at the mainstream churches, but they also look at what used to be on the fringes. <laughs> what are these? So withered and so wild in their attire that look not like the inhabitants of the earth, and yet they're on it. Live you? Or are you aught that man may question? You seem to understand me. By each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. You should be women. Yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. Speak if you can. <laughs> what are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Glass. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Cordor. All hail, Macbeth, that shall be king hereafter. Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? In the name of truth, are ye fantastical? Or that indeed which outwardly ye show? My noble partner, you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped with all. To me you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favors nor your hate. Hail. 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 Lesser than the best. And Rita. Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So all hail Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth. All hail. Stay! You imperfect speakers. Tell me more. By Sinnel's death, I know I'm Thane of Glams. But how of Cordor? Thane of Cordor lives, prosperous gentleman. And to be king stands not in the prospect of belief, no more than to be Cordor. Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence, or why upon this blasted heath you stop our way with such prophetic greetings. Speak. I charge you. Although goddess worship is no longer a basis for hatred, it is still feared by some, and misconceptions can still have disastrous consequences. In 1997, it was reported that in a small village in rural Russia, two men had attempted to kill an entire family because they believed one of the women to be a witch. She survived their brutal attack, but another woman was killed and four children were rushed to hospital with serious injuries. The men readily admitted to the authorities what they had done, accusing the woman of hexing one of them. Perhaps this illustrates why the pagan community still exists under a veil of seclusion and secrecy. 
what is important about modern witchcraft is that it is an attempt, and a serious and sincere attempt, to get back to a kind of earth religion, a natural religion. And that's where its importance lies, I think. Um, and we can see sen a sense in which modern witchcraft connects very well with uh, the green movement, uh, the, the concerns about ecology, about getting back to the earth and not damaging the earth. And that, of course, is what modern witchcraft, or one of the most important tenets of modern witchcraft, is living in harmony with the natural order. And if, if I wanted to summarise modern witchcraft, that's the way I would summarise it. With modern-day writers spinning tales of witches and witchcraft aimed at children, the traditional question asked on storm-battered, rain-drenched, wind-blasted heath of when shall we three meet again is more likely to be answered with, well, I can manage next Tuesday, than with fear and persecution. Torture and the stake have given way to entertainment and a newfound faith in older ways. Witchcraft is mainly represented through literature and the media, portrayed with a traditional image. We can see now that this is a far cry from the true practices of the craft.